A very warm welcome to you all and thank you for joining us on what should be a really interesting Bats in Live session. Um, I'll just start introducing as people, um, as people roll in to, to view. Um, my name is Rachel Arnold, I'm the Heritage Advisor for the Bats in Churches project. Many of you already know of the Bats in Churches project, but just to briefly summarise, we are a heritage lottery funded project aiming to help churches, their communities and their bats live more harmoniously together. We work a lot on practical solutions at our project churches, but we also want to share the wonderful world of churches, of bats and of bats in churches, churches with more people, which includes doing things like this, like the Bats in Churches live webinar series. So today's webinar focuses more on church buildings, how they have changed over time and perhaps some tips on how we can date them. And I'm joined by three experts on this very subject, Dr. Louise Hampson, John Beiger and Jonathan Chorofsky. We have done several BIC Live sessions now and we have covered many subjects. So if you want to find out more about the project or to watch some of our earlier talks, you can find us on YouTube got a YouTube channel, it's Bats in Churches. Um, so we'll crack on with the main subject. Churches are rich and varied buildings. Many of them are very ancient and so we are sometimes confronted by lots of different building phases from different dates in one church. Bits fall down or get rebuilt and extensions are added sometimes in new styles but also in old styles. So there can be a lot to throw a church detective off course. Each church is different, which makes them a joy to visit, and it makes it a really exciting challenge to work out how the building, decoration and furnishings have developed over time. Each of our speakers will tackle a slightly different aspect of the topic, so hopefully by the end of today's session we will have um, a better understanding of churches more. There will be three short talks, followed by a Q&A session. So please take this opportunity to ask our experts anything you've ever wondered about churches. You can drop your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Louise Hampson. She is uh, an academic working in the Christianity and Culture Department of the University of York. She's published numerous articles and books on York Minster, for example, and other religious buildings and produced educational DVDs as well. So if you'd like to start sharing your screen, I will hand straight over. Thank you, Rachel. I hope um, everyone can see this screen. So I've entitled my section, How to Read a Church Starting with the Outside. And what I want to cover in the, uh, the brief time that I have is three main areas, really. Thinking about uh, where a church is in relation to its community and landscape and what that can tell you about its history. We're going to look a bit at styles and, as Rachel said, some of the traps that you can fall into. Um, thank you, the Victorians. And then finish up uh, briefly with a bit about materials and what those can sometimes tell you about the age or origin of a church. And I know Jonathan's gonna talk in much more detail later about that with some case studies. So uh, we're going to start with uh, this church. This is a, a familiar site in the sense of quite often, this is how we approach a church. We start walking up the path um, and the church is before us and we go, oh, that's nice. Um, and then we get a bit closer and we start perhaps to notice um, that there are features that um, seem a little bit odd. We will come back to this church later in my, my talk. But there, as you can see here, um, there's a lead covered spire, there's a, a rendered tower, uh, the, most of the church is in Flint, but it all sort of looks quite of a piece. You can see there's parapets that go around the whole of the body of the church that match the ones um, on the tower, the windows look you know, more or less the same and so it can give the appearance um, of being all of a piece and set in this case in a very uh, beautiful churchyard. 
This is um, the Church of St Mary Harrow on the Hill. And I am just briefly going to talk you through this building, which to say we will come back to before we uh, look a bit more at the landscape thing. So this church, um, oh, sorry, um, this church was actually um, founded in the 11th century um, and the bottom part of the tower, um, this section here, um, does date from them. And I'll draw your attention because this will matter later um, to the little tiny round headed window here. But as you can see, the windows in the upper part are rather different and the cement render um, does not obviously date from the 11th century. The rest of the church was built in the 15th century. Um, but not looking like this. So there are some um, clues in here in terms of things like window styles, which I'll come on to, but essentially this part of the church was extensively, well, restored slash rebuilt um, in the 1840s um, by George Gilbert Scott. And he is responsible for uh, the adding of the parapets he faced the whole of the church in Flint and he rebuilt many of the windows, although reusing some of the earlier stone. So already in just one church, we've got a really complicated story and things that might um, be used as clues to give you age can sometimes also throw you off course. But I just want to take a step back um, and look at where churches are in their landscape and their community and what that can tell you about a history as you approach it. Um, as we're in lockdown, I figured I'd stick with ones close to home. And as you can see, Google Maps has helpfully told you that this one is 11 minutes drive from where I live. Uh, this is a Google map of the church of St. Mary in the village of Westow. Uh, St. Mary's Westow is a largely medieval church, although it was very heavily restored in the 1860s. Um, it was a Saxon foundation and there is one piece of Saxon stonework that survives. But the thing, the reason I'm showing you this is this is the church and this is the village. There is a lot of local mythology about, oh, you know, the village moved or uh, there was this much bigger lost village uh, and the church was right at the heart of it, neither of which are true. And the reason I'm showing you this map rather than the lovely picture of the church is because, as you can see from the fields around it, if this church had been surrounded by uh, a deserted medieval village, of which there are many in Yorkshire. Um, there would, in this summer photo, be a lot of crop mark evidence, but as you can see, there is, apart from a few ditches, um, there is complete dearth of that. The reason the church is out here is because originally it was known as St Mary's Ad Mora, or St Mary's on the Moor, um, and was actually um, connected to a monastic foundation, which is about a mile this way um, at Kirkham Priory. Um, it also um, is at a relatively high point um, on the Wolds and is reputed, and I use the word advisedly, reputed to have acted as a guide beacon for people travelling from Beverley um, to Kirkham. Frankly, you'd have to have a very tall tower and be working quite hard for that to have been true, but it certainly um, was a monastic foundation or connected with a monastic foundation. So its relationship to the village is a rather complicated one. Um, but this is the parish, this is the village, um, which has this now very detached church. But more commonly, we see churches right at the heart of um, villages and, and towns. This is another one uh, relatively close by to me. This is about 20 minutes drive away um, in the village of Slingsby. This is the Church of All Saints. Um, entirely rebuilt in the Victorian period, although on the footprint of its medieval predecessor, um, it was rebuilt, as I've said here, by Admiral Howard of the Castle Howard family. And the relationship I want to highlight here is partly to do with some uh, road names, but to do with the relationship between the church and the ruined medieval castle of Slingsby Castle. When we look at where parishes, parish churches are, particularly post-Norman um, foundations, there is often a relationship between the seat of power and where the church is. In this particular instance, the castle is all in this um, area, this grey area at the bottom of the, the screen. And 
you can tell from some of the road names that this is the oldest part of the village. You've got the incredibly common name of High Street. Then you've got Church Lane on which the church actually sits. You've got a road called the Green, which unsurprisingly skirts around the village green. And it's not until you get slightly further out that you get more modern names like Railway Street. So you can see here that the church is absolutely at the heart of the village. So although the church that you see today is a Victorian rebuild and very clearly all of a piece, it's actually capturing and commemorating uh, a much earlier relationship. In this particular instance, this church did not incorporate earlier fabric. It was entirely uh, in, in the exterior. There is um, rebuilt stuff inside, but in the exterior, um, it was using new stone from uh, the Castle Howard estate. Um, I'm showing you this just because why wouldn't you want a picture of Glastonbury Tor, really? Um, there is often a lot in church, um, in how to read church books about appropriation of earlier sacred sites. And this is probably the most extreme and most famous one. This is the tower on top of Glastonbury Tor. But again, looking at the landscape in which a church sits, early establishments of churches are often on the highest points um, in settlements, which in turn have often been sites of sacred significance um, in earlier periods. This distinction does get a bit blurred, but certainly if you're looking at rural churches, you will often find them um, situated on the highest point, um, and so they stand out uh, within their, their community. So when we look at churches themselves, this is another one um, close by me. This is the lovely little church of St Nicholas North Grimston, which is a tiny little church. Um, this sits absolutely at the heart of its village. Um, it isn't on particularly high ground, but what you will notice, I hope, is that the land around it um, has risen. You can see the curve here. And in fact, this later porch protects the fact that there are now four steps down from the churchyard level down into the body of the church. And the reason the porch was put on was because um, that difference meant that water was flooding in to the church in the 19th century. And so they put a porch on to try and stem the flow. The rise and growth of churchyards around churches can tell you quite a lot um, about the age of a building and will have an impact um, on its fabric. It tends to be most exaggerated in larger towns and cities where, of course, the practice of charnel houses, in other words, the bones that get dug up when you're burying someone else, um, get stored um, in a separate building. But the height of the land around a church um, can tell you something about its age, even if the fabric that you're looking at has been heavily restored or reused. At this point, and because there is a slight nature thing to this, um, I'm just going to pop in, please don't be misled by yew trees. Don't get me wrong, I'm a massive fan of yew trees. I think they're great. But there is this idea that every yew tree in a churchyard is of enormously venerable age and indicates that there's been a church there for 2000 years. Yews actually grow remarkably quickly in the first hundred years of their life. Um, and so the fact that there's a big yew tree may indicate that you have a very early sacred site or that a church has been there for a very long time. Equally, it may just indicate you have very fertile soil and somebody planted a quick growing yew. So please don't be misled by yew trees when you're trying to date your church. But I want to look at this, uh, some clues in the fabric because I'm conscious of the time is running out. Um, so this church um, has undergone a number of changes over time. Um, as I said in the earlier slide, it's a Romanesque church, it's a 11th to early 12th century church originally. Um, and it's undergone some quite significant changes. The first one of which I hope you can see here, and this is a common feature in churches, is the roof line has changed. These diagonal lines here show you that the earlier roof had a much steeper pitch and was lowered um, in this case in the late 15th, early 16th century. But the scar of the original roof line um, remains on the church. What it also shows you, however, looking at this, is that the actual footprint of the church has not significantly altered. The end of the roof line is the same position as the end of the roof line um, today. So this steep pitch roof is a common feature of earlier 
um, church designs. And the later you go into the uh, late medieval period, generally speaking, the flatter roofs get. The next thing um, that, oh, hang on, sorry, that's not the one. This is the next one. Uh, the next one is looking at windows. If you look up here, if you remember from the first slide I showed you, I talked about small round headed windows. Here's um, a double splay one, a double window in the top of this um, 12th century tower. Um, generally speaking, the smaller the window is, the earlier it is. That's a gross generalization, but I'm sticking with it. Um, and early windows tend to have round tops, um, whereas the more elaborate forms um, are indications of um, gradual evolutions in style. Contrast it with these ones, these square headed windows that date from when this roof was flattened. So these are late 15th, early 16th century windows that were rebuilt um, when this wall, part of the wall of the church um, was altered to accommodate the new roof. Style can be an indicator of age and it can reflect changes in fashion, um, certainly wealth, liturgical practice and patronage, but it's always, it's relatively easy, even for really experienced church detectives to be hoodwinked by Victorian restorations. On the right, on the left, sorry, we have um, St Mary's Church in Thirsk, which dates primarily, uh, was, was extensively rebuilt between 1430 and about 1485. And that's when um, certainly the bulk of the um, church originally dated from. This feature here might look like um, it's earlier. You'll see the narrow, uh, smaller windows. However, this church was extensively restored by George Street in the 19th century, and he had a bit of a thing for early English style. So he altered these windows to, to reflect the style that he liked whilst retaining the 15th or late 14th, early 15th century style um, of these windows here. He also um, rebuilt a large section of the East End and you can see um, the tooling here on this stone um, is very regular. Um, the stone itself has been very carefully faced. And again, the overall impression um, is that the church is largely of a piece. We've already talked about St Mary Harrow on the Hill um, with the work done uh, with the flint to create the uh, unity of appearance and the installation of these parapets again to create a, a sense of um, connectedness between the much earlier tower which was raised and then the rebuilding and refacing. You'll notice these windows here um, are broader, the, the tracery in them is more, more complex that's uh, very distinctive of the Gothic style um, of architecture of the um, late 14th and early 15th centuries. This window here uh, is in a slightly later style and things move on eventually um, into perpendicular where things become a lot squarer. But in the time I have available, um, we don't have a lot of scope to go into the finer points um, of that. So just to finish, I just want to touch briefly on materials, which again can tell you about the locality, but also about patronage and other connections. I mentioned St Mary Westow and its connections with um, the monastic sites um, at Kirk and Priory. On the left here, uh, we have the spectacular Beverly Minster, um, a church which is effectively York Minster in miniature. Um, enormously elaborate, very lavishly um, funded by the Archbishops of York um, to create a very spectacular pilgrimage church, uh, far in excess of what the town of Beverley um, itself would normally have been able to support. Contrast this with um, the early church of St Mary Bishop Hill Junior um, in York, in which um, Intriguingly, and for some people somewhat confusingly, a lot of Roman material has been used. That has led some people to believe that this is in fact a Roman church. It isn't. Um, it does date from most of the standing fabric um, is actually uh, medieval, although there is a Saxon tower. Um, and you can, I think, I hope in this photograph, just pick out um, some of the reused Roman brick and tile um, and this rather distinctive um, Saxon long and short work down this tower coin here. But again, you've got a uh, small round headed window here and then later, later windows here. But you can see the texture of the tower is quite different 
um, from the rest of the church. And just finally, and I have overrun my time and I apologize for that. Um, <clears throat> we've got a, an early brick church um, on the right. This is um, St. Michael Beer Church in Essex, uh, gorgeous 14th century brick tower. Uh, the church itself was built in brick, unusually early in the 15th century, but the church completely rebuilt by the Victorians. And what I just want to notice here as you finish is you can tell a lot by texture. If you look at the brick of the church tower here, you can see that it's much more individual and uneven than the bricks reused and refaced when the church was rebuilt. And those in turn are more interesting and more individual than the machine made bricks that built the porch um, in 1872. So that absolutely lightning gallop through churches um, and their history, I hope has given you some clues and ways of starting to, to work your way in. Uh, but do beware of the Victorians, they fool the best of us. Um, really good Victorian work can look remarkably like medieval work. So uh, do dig around, but do think about the church um, in context and try and understand why and how it was built um, as well as the church in front of you. Thank you. Brilliant, thank you so much, Louise. Um, and well, yeah, well done for squeezing in such a, a wide topic in such a small space of time. I think we've given ourselves a challenge for today, really. <laughs> um, and it was really, I'm, my hometown is York, so it was really good to see some familiar, familiar churches as well. Um, so passing on to John Viger now, he's going to look a little bit more of the interiors in churches. John has a long-standing professional um, working relationship with churches, I think. He, he's worked for the Churches Conservation Trust in the past for many years. He's um, a trustee of the Friends of Friendless Churches and a member of the Academic Advisory Board for the Centre for Parish Church Studies as well. But he gives lots and lots of guided tours and talks of historic churches and has published many books as well. So over to you, John. Thank you very much. Thanks, Rachel. Good afternoon, everybody. It was lovely to see in that last uh, slide that you saw uh, one of my church tours. And um, as I go around churches, it's absolutely fascinating to see how people relate to them today. But of course, people have been relating to buildings ever since they were first constructed. And in the same way that, that we redecorate our houses or perhaps get rid of an old city and bring a new one in, so too churches have continually changed since their uh, first time of building. And this afternoon, I want to just show you some of the key things to look for when visiting a church. As you walk up to a church and are obviously keen to get inside, in the back of our minds, we all know how that church should look. We all expect to come in somewhere near the west end of the church, either in a west door or a north or south door, to come inside and see that everything is orientated facing the east, with ranks of serried benches all facing in that direction, with a pulpit, either on the north or south side at the east end of the nave, the part of the church in which we're standing. And then we expect in the distance to see a series of steps into the chancel and then at the far east end, another set of steps to take the altar and to make it the focal point of everything we see. And in this particular church, of course, the altar has been given a fantastic screen behind it, a reredos, uh, to make sure that that's where we look. But much of what we expect to see in a church today is the result of 19th century intervention. Just as you heard from Louise that the buildings themselves have often been altered, so too have the interiors, and they've gone through many adaptations over the years. When you think that originally churches were very simple buildings, indeed, 
This is how many churches might have looked originally. This has got a beaten earth floor. And until the 13th century, the vast majority of ordinary parish churches would have looked like this. They were very simple in that they had few items of furnishing. There would have been an altar. It would have been of stone. Uh, this is obviously a, a more recent holy table. The walls would have been plastered and then covered with decoration. Because most of our churches have remained in continuous use since they were first built, very few buildings today still have these beaten earth floors. This one became a farm building, which is why it looks the way it does today. In fact, the best place to take you to show you what a medieval church might have looked like at its peak, I'm going to take you across the border into Wales and the fantastic church of Llandilo Talibont. This is now to be found in St Fagan's Museum, the outdoor museum for Wales, you know, the equivalent of, of Beamish or the Black Country Museum or Singleton in England. A lot of buildings have been rescued from elsewhere and re-erected, including this church. It's the first time a medieval church was taken down stone by stone and reconstructed in the modern age. And having rebuilt the church, it was decided to furnish it as it may have been in the Middle Ages. So, the main thing I suspect you notice straight away are the wall paintings, but they're not a set. They have been added at different times and so represent not a schematic program of design, but individual saints chosen by donors as individual as us. Secondly, the building is divided into two, east-west, the nave in which we are standing and the chancel, which as you can see is almost hidden behind that screen. So the, the screen fits the width of the chancel arch and above it is the rude loft, which was really the main symbol for us in the church, because we would very rarely go into the chancel. Above the screen is the figure of crucified Christ with Our Lady and St John, the group known as the Rood. And every single church would have had this feature in medieval England. In Wales, they're slightly different in, in design. Uh, with this very heavy loft on the top. In England, they tended to be uh, less substantial and you could see through them. You see there are no seats in our part of the church. And that's because medieval churches didn't have seating. They had stone benches around them. And here's a stone bench in the church of Talith Lynn in Gwynedd. Most people would just come and go. They wouldn't stay for the whole of the liturgy. They went there to make sure that the priest was conducting the service on their behalf. If you were infirm or stayed a bit longer than most, you would go and perch yourself on these seats, which could also be around the base of piers if you had a church with aisles. When wooden seating first came in, it took the form of these benches that you see here today. So one end resting on the existing stone bench and the other a very simple frame. It's fair to say that the vast majority of churches didn't get any form of seating until the 16th century. But in some areas of England, East Anglia and Somerset, and the West Country, we do find early seats. Once most churches had got seats, so let's say at the Reformation, we start to get private seats or pews. 
And this is a good example at a church's Conservation Trust Church in Norfolk, the church at Friends, very early 17th century uh, box pew. And this has seats all around it and was very much your private domain. In fact, it was your private property and nobody else could use it. And if you had several wealthy landowners who wanted their private spaces, you would find a series of these box pews. But in this particular church, we have ordinary benches as well for those who couldn't afford to uh, have their own private space. In some churches, there was no provision for public seating and churches became completely filled with box pews, as you see here at Winterbourne Thompson in Dorset. If the poor wanted to attend, they would have to sit on the floor in the central gangway. Because this was a status symbol, this was your private space and often it had your name on it. So a stranger coming to church would know that it wasn't available to anybody. Of course, this cost you money. You had to pay rent. And this was how churches were able to afford maintenance in the post-Reformation period. In 1819, in the Somerset village of Camley, a very generous benefactor put up this south gallery, which runs the length of the south wall, just so that the poor would have somewhere in which to sit. But just to reinforce those class distinctions I mentioned just now, that gallery is entered by its own external staircase. So the poor wouldn't have to go into the same door as the people who had paid good money to do so. We saw a reproduction, a modern screen, in the uh, church at Slandile Tally Pont. This is an original rood screen of 1500 in Slanano in Radnorshire. Screens were declared illegal in 1547 and the vast majority were taken down, but in remote areas where they thought nobody would come and, and check up on them or where they'd only just finished building it as here, they probably said, we're not gonna go along with the law. It's absolutely ridiculous. So we do get screens uh, surviving, usually in a less preserved state of repair. This is at Harwell in Oxfordshire, but it's a nice little medieval screen, which of course has lost its loft. The loft on top of the screen was there so that somebody could climb up every day and light the statues, the candles in front of the statues of the crucified Christ. And you'll often find in churches, these little staircases going nowhere. They're usually at the junction of the nave and the chancel. And so this would allow a, a sacristan to climb up, come out of the upper door and walk across the top of the loo, of the rood screen in the loft. The other thing that's changed considerably in churches are altars. This is a medieval altar made of stone. Uh, we call this top a mensa. And you could always distinguish them because they have five consecration crosses on them, one at each corner and one in the centre. At the Reformation, these were declared illegal too and thrown out. And if you find them in a church today, they've probably been brought back into use. They were replaced by what are known as holy tables, which had to be of wood and were usually very much smaller. This one at Barton Bendish in Norfolk helpfully has the date 1633 on it. And here's another one at Liddington in Rutland. This one is fascinating because it's enclosed on four sides. 
So when Holy Communion was administered here in the 17th century, the communions would come and stand on all four sides of the altar. But during the 17th century, these holy tables, as they wanted them to be known, were often pushed back against the wall. And that allowed a great display like this, where a screen behind the altar, a reredos, is erected in classical style, and it will have on it the Lord's Prayer, the Ten Commandments, and the Creed. And this was law until the 1860s. Every church had to have these commandment boards. Often you'll find them, you know, put under the tower or moved to another part of the church. But until the 1860s, they had to adorn the East Wall. And to finish off, I just wanted to, to show you an extreme example of what happens to churches under the Victorians. This is the parish church of Brighton, St Nicholas, nice 14th century church, high on the hill, just like Louise mentioned earlier. And you see that by 1850, it's been absolutely choked solid with seats. So we've got box pews here in the nave, We've got a South Gallery, a North Gallery, and there's even an Eastern Gallery built on top of the medieval rood screen. Facing, of course, West, the wrong way, as we would interpret it today. But when I show you a picture of this same view now, it's almost unrecognisable. In fact, the only things in common are the arches of the arcades and the base of that medieval screen. This is how the Victorians thought medieval churches had looked before they became full up of uh, post-Reformation furnishings. We know now it's not quite right, but they were working towards the right direction. So I think it's fascinating, you know, as I take groups around churches today, Everyone has their own special interest, whether it's in fonts or pulpits or altars or commandment boards. And I think that's a very good way of, of beginning to study churches. Pick something that interests you and look for that one feature in every church you visit, because believe me, they are all different. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. So yeah, that was truly fascinating and really nice to see that um, oil painting, especially at the end and how absolutely full it must have been with people in my, the high up services. I've never seen an East Gallery before. <laughs> that was really wonderful. Um, so our last speaker before we um, go on to the Q&A session, which do keep feeding in your questions, we've got some coming in, they're really, really good, um, is Jonathan Trosky. Uh, Jonathan is a chartered RIBA architect uh, working in, well, specialising in heritage conservation and um, a church architect. And he has been working on a few of our, well, one of our Bats in Churches projects, and it's one of our larger ones down in Sussex. Um, yeah, he's um, going to talk about uh, specific examples of churches, I think. Uh, and he's, you know, generally keen to improve public understanding of old buildings and um, has authored specialist articles and done talks about uh, churches in the past as well. So over to you, Jonathan. Thank you. Thanks very much, Rachel. So for my 10 minutes, I'm going to split it into a quick introduction to me and the practice I work for. I'm going to tell you a little bit about how I go about dating elements of a building and then show how I've applied it in projects that we're working on at the moment. So this is me. Uh, I don't take that many photographs of myself. They tend to be of the old buildings themselves. But this was uh, recently at St. Nicholas Church in Worth. We just reshingled the spire and it was putting the putting the regilded cockerel back onto the top and I'm six foot four. So it comes in handy when you're at the top of the scaffolding as the person on site who can reach the thing. And that's our office in East Grinstead, um, which is a building we restored in 2016, uh, a two star listed building on the end of the historic high streets. And here's some of my team uh, doing a quinquennial inspection in Brighton. 
Now, I was trying to think of a good um, analogy or metaphor for how I go about dating a building. It's probably nowhere near as scholarly as um, what John or Louise said. And I thought the best anal analogy was, uh, guess who? So I don't know if any of you remember this game, but the, the premise of it is you've got a card and the per person playing against you has a card and you've got to guess the face they've got on their card. And the easy way to do it, the way to play the game, the way to win is you start with the big broad questions which get rid of lots and lots of um, potential answers or faces or bits of a building. And then you get more and more specific as you, as you, um, as you kind of hone in on the age of a bit of a building. So, as an example, uh, these are two buildings with sash windows. And if you were trying to date a building uh, or date at least an element of a building and you were looking at sash windows, you could say, OK, well, when 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 were sash windows popular and when did they come into uh, in, into use? And they, broadly speaking, um, they came into use about um, when the Great Fire of London happened in 1666 at a point when buildings were very close to each other and if you had casements that potentially in very narrow streets could touch one another if um, buildings were facing each other that's one end of the spectrum at the other end of the time period um, they kind of fell out of use broadly speaking at the beginning of the 20th century so you've got a time range um, and you can discount everything before that and you can potentially discount things after that but then if you know certain rules or um, rules of thumb as it were um, within that time period you can start to date the window so generally speaking the glazing got bigger as it was easier to manufacture and transport larger pieces of glazing as time went on um, but then another thing would be for example in London um, windows tended to be um, set at the front of the opening until 1709 when the rules and regulations the building regulations changed and they had to be set in by four inches um, so you, you've got kind of a point where you can say is this building pre-1709 or post-1709 and then they changed again in 1774 and the sash uh, box so that's the bit around the outside of the window would be set behind the masonry so you can start to get closer into the time period that a building was built or dating that component of the building now applying this to churches on the flyer there was two questions that were um, posed and one of them was about um, Victorian reproductions which I think Louise and John have fairly well covered um, and another was how would you tell an early English from a perpendicular church building so I don't know if any of you know this is this is Salisbury Cathedral um, and this is an early English bit of built fabric now early English and perpendicular sort of bookend a larger period of uh, English architectural history called the English Gothic period, which ran from the 12th century to the 17th century. Now, the first period in early English, as here, ran from the 12th to the 13th century. It was followed by decorated Gothic from the 13th to the 14th, and then perpendicular Gothic from the 14th to the 17th century. One of the things about early English windows is they sometimes be described as lancet style, and a lancet is a tall, thin window with an arched head and a point at the top. Quite often they'd be grouped in two or three. So if you see that, it's generally indicative of an early English church. Whereas a four centered arch, which is that squatter arch that Louise was talking about, is much more indicative of perpendicular Gothic um, with transoms, which are transoms and mullions. Mullions are the vertical bits of stone and transoms are the bits of horizontal stone um, to support the thing. So you know, by some rules of thumb, you can sort of start to potentially get towards the age of bits of a building's fabric. So got three quick examples. So this is St. Giles Church in Horsted Canes, um, which is uh, a church where I'm the inspecting architect. It's grade one listed and it's, it's very lovely. I got a call one day, uh, two years ago to say, Jonathan, a bit of the church ceiling has fallen down. Can you come and have a look? So, and this is worth, keeping in mind beforehand, this is a diagram of the phasing of, of, of the building with the yellow phase being the earliest, then the orange bits, then the blue bits, and then the green bits uh, rounded by the Victorians. So that's why I arrived to, a bit of ceiling on the floor and uh, the area where the plaster work had fallen down. Now, we put a tower up and we had a look and the laths, it's a lath and plaster ceiling. So there's laths fixed between the common rafters and then the plaster was applied onto that. Um, and this had happened before bits of plaster had fallen down and talking to the church wardens, one of them 
um, very kindly provided these photographs, um, which were from just before the church was restored by the Victorians in 1885. And you, it's obviously, you know, it shows lots of interesting things. It shows the, uh, the box pews that John was talking about. But at the top of the image in both cases, you can see that there is a plastered ceiling, a Georgian plastered ceiling. And that was taken out, presumably, by the Victorians when they added their extension. And that they, you know, good practice, let's re-roof the church at the same time. Um, now, the interesting thing about the detailing of it is that the laths were applied to the back of the roof structure. So effectively, after someone had stripped off the whole roof, fixed the laths from above and then put the roof, uh, the new clay tile roof finish onto the top. So we found that what was happening was a bit like when you push a paracetamol out of a packet and pop it. Um, when there's really stormy conditions, wind rushes up in the gap um, behind the laths and was popping off bits of the plasterwork. If we hadn't been able to date it as a Victorian bit of fabric, we wouldn't have quite been able to get to that. What we ended up doing was putting a special slightly flexible lime plaster on with a mesh embedded in it. So it effectively has a crash net um, inbuilt into the lime plaster. So if a piece was ever to fall again, um, it would still fail, but it wouldn't drop onto somebody and potentially hurt them in church. And that's the finished ceiling, so you can barely tell the difference that anything had been done. Um, another church, um, this is um, in West Hoadley, um, just around the corner from our office. Now, again, we had a look and had a look at the phasing of different bits of the building. And this is why it's sometimes interesting and useful to look at individual elements because bits have been reused, it's been rebuilt and repurposed. But it also helps you determine which are the most historically significant bits of historic built fabric so that when you're designing works to it, as we were in this case, um, you can make sure that it doesn't do any harm to the significance or disturb the reading of those bits of the building fabric. Um, so again, here we're trying to pick up on the glazing of the quatrefoil window and um, the spacing and detailing of the organ loft without being too pastiche and relying on copying existing details. Um, Whereas areas for change, such as the Victorian vestry, which had been kind of eroded over a long period of time by incremental changes, which weren't particularly um, sensitive to the existing building, meant that we could better frame the Victorian fabric um, and, and make more of a thing of it, but then also make the existing church building work a little bit harder. And based on the diagram, you could see churches iterate, they change over time to suit the congregation and to suit the local community. And it's not conservation isn't about stopping that change it's about managing it and making sure that the important things are retained um, and then finally this is uh, to bring us back to the bats in churches project this is saint george's church um, in uh, west grinstead and um, simon jenkins described it in his england's thousand best churches as like a sussex farmer in a tweed jacket which i quite like because it actually wears a concrete cementitious jacket which isn't quite so nice and was added at some point in the 20th century but internally it's rather lovely and it has the pews have the names of the families who uh, who 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 lived on the local farms on them and it has lots of interesting memorials and brasses and so forth inside and it also has a bat population i guess due to the fact it's in the middle of the countryside there's open water and trees nearby all of the things that bats like and the bats they get in through the uh, the eaves and cracks around the roof and um and they cause an issue for the congregation however um when we were approached by the Bats in Churches project um, with Chris Demand, our ecologist leading the thing, um, he was saying, well, look, there's uh, areas where there was previously a ceiling in the in the church and where the, the bits of um, the chancel still have a boarded ceiling. So if we reinstated the ceiling, um, which we've got evidence that there previously was something in that place, in, in, in place in those areas, and there's uh, evidence from nail holes and things on the existing timber work um, that would create a roosting space above for the bats and it would allow the congregation a usable space for services below um, so it's a bit of a work in progress but um, yeah we're getting there so that again um, by understanding dating bits of the historic built fabric of the church we were able to come to a solution um, that suited the project needs and that's me, I think. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, 
so that's our whistle stop tour through um all of um <laughs> the history of church building which is you know quite a lot to squeeze in so our speakers have done very well with their 10 minutes allotted time but we've got time for questions now and we've had quite a few so um I, I want to start off with one, uh, and it's aimed at everybody, because it, we're, we're quite, um, by chance, we've got three speakers from very different areas in the country. And I wanted to quickly ask everybody um, if there is a key characteristic of um, church buildings in your county. So Jonathan is in Sussex. Yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm in Sussex. Yep. So there's um, obviously the stylistic things, but there's also local materials. And this is why it's often very important to have an architect who working on a church building who is used to those materials. So where we are, Horsham stone roofs are um, are atypical of the area, um, obviously coming from around Horsham and Weald and Sandstone. The Weald is an area of uh, Sussex, um, which has a very distinctive um, honeycomb looking sandstone. Nice and John, you are in Norfolk, is that right? I am indeed. And uh, characteristic of churches up here are the fantastic rood screens that still survive. Uh, we have over a hundred medieval rood screens surviving in the county, many of which are painted with images of saints, and uh, it's the finest collection anywhere in the country. Fab. Yeah, I've seen some. They are very beautiful. Yeah, and Louise in the Yorkshire area anything particularly standing out for you um local materials um count a lot there are some fantastic quarries um in Yorkshire so we do have some very splendid stone churches although on the walls where I live which is East Yorkshire the stone is actually the local stone is actually quite poor so quite a distinct feature unfortunately it's sort of slowly dissolving chalky churches but um I think one of the things that um, is quite distinctive, certainly more in West Yorkshire, is the impact, frankly, and I know this is true also of um, East Anglia, is you can see when places have been very prosperous and West Yorkshire is very prosperous in the Victorian period. And boy, they went for it in terms of um, rebuilding churches and using import, well, imported materials in the sense of um, different sort of bricks and stones and, and things like that. So. Um, so locality matters. Yeah, I suppose importing different materials can throw it through you somewhat. Um, here in East Anglia, we have a lot of flint. So I'm in, I'm in Essex, we've got a lot of flint churches. Um, so that's one of our defining features. Um, uh, some of the other questions. So John, we had one from uh, someone in our audience who said why, and this will touch again as well on your on the root screen uh, comment, which are so common in um, Norfolk. Why do you think that there are more pews um, surviving in, in box pew sort of style in Norfolk? I think we, in East Anglia, we had a, a great boom in the uh, late 15th, early 16th century. And so we put seats into churches and then we didn't have any money after the Reformation. So they, they haven't changed things. Uh, whereas in other parts of the country, because they didn't put their uh, seats in until after the Reformation, they uh, were all private seats and these were done away with by the Victorians. So I think East Anglia is purely because we had the money at one period and didn't have it afterwards. That's a very fair point. <laughs> um, okay, and another one was about um, the church heritage record. Now the church heritage record is an online um, source for church buildings run by the Church of England. And it's, it says a sort of approximate date for when the church is from. Um, and, and the question was sort of, is that the earliest date or is it, um, I guess of the most substantial fabric. I know Louise, you, you answered it a bit in the chat. I don't know if Jonathan, if you had any experience from your architects background as well with church heritage record. No, I think Louise is absolutely right. Um, yeah, it tends to be, I, I, in my experience, it's normally the earliest bit of fabric, but sometimes it does mention when there's other bits, um, you know, as, as the building has been subsequently developed, but yeah. 
the dating is normally its earliest point. Good, yeah. It's sometimes quite um, broad as well. Sometimes it says medieval. <laughs> it's also worth bearing in mind that quite a lot of information on the church heritage record um, is supplied by churches themselves, which you know obviously is great in terms of people wanting to contribute information. It does sometimes um, reflect things that people believe to be true rather than necessarily having rock solid evidence. So some of the um, very early dates that crop up in that are when people believe their church was founded, but when you actually go there, the standing church can be largely significantly later. So I take the dates on there to be more of a, a guide than an absolute. Yeah, that sounds like a sensible approach, I think. Um, questions for all of you again. Um, uh, do you have any recommended reading material or websites that are very useful for um, the, the subjects, I suppose, approaching um, dating churches, I guess? Um, Louise, would you like to go first? Um, gosh, there's a there's a huge range of material. I mean, at the sort of um, more detailed end, there are obviously the, the Pevsner guides, which are being updated um, at the moment, um, and they will give you quite a lot of um, architectural um, detail um, and dating. There is, and I'm just, I, it will come back to me, there is actually a very good um, couple of little more general books, one called, helpfully, How to Read a Church, um, and the other one called the Church Record, uh, the Church Detectives Handbook, I think it is, um, which are um, aimed at, at people just sort of starting out, really, in in this um, very fun exploration. I mean, it is highly addictive. Um, so those are a couple um, that I would recommend online. Um, of course, the um, the listing um, detailed in um, the British history um, online will give you again um, specific architectural um, detail and of course and I'm speaking on behalf of a colleague here the fantastic Victoria County histories um, which are now also a lot of them available online will give you a lot of background information and particularly about families that have been involved because that can tell you a lot about why things are built when. Great yeah um, any others John? Uh, it's probably the book that Louise was referring to, and it's the Handbook to the English Parish Church uh, by Stephen Fryer. Uh, it's quite a, a, a meaty volume, but it's in paperback, and it will give you a, a background to almost anything to do with the church, both architectural and furnishing. And it really has got to be your Bible if you're starting out on the subject. That's good. I think um, I haven't seen that one yet, so I'll have to add it to my list. Um, Jonathan, any suggestions? Yeah, I, I think Victoria County history is always very good. Um, buildingconservation.com, um, I, I quite like as a website, it has really interesting articles about bits and pieces if, you know, you can find something specific to what, you know, the, uh, an element of a historic building. Uh, church or otherwise that you're interested in and then um, Bannister Fletcher's A History of Architecture I think is a great book it has really good in, uh, illustrations and it shows uh, for example you know it covers everything not just church buildings but um, you know the way in which things developed um, you know with examples of comparative floor plans and things next to each other so you can um, you can kind of see how things progressed in an iterative way. Oh, that's nice. It sounds really nice and visual. I think we've got time for one more, but we'll might overrun a tiny bit, but that's OK. Um, one of the audience, Rose, has asked, what is your favourite church style and why? Um, <laughs> again, another rather broad question, but um, would anyone like to uh, volunteer to go first? All deep and lost in thought. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll pitch in with um, setting aside my personal adoration of all things Saxon, which I appreciate is a niche interest by most people. Um, I 
I like the um, just the sort of start of the decorated Gothic when they start to move out of the early English, the, um, the, the reasonably sort of simple ones, which was much beloved by the Victorians. So you see a lot of Victorian churches built in early English style. Um, and just when masons and carvers start to get a little bit more carried away and it all gets a bit more quirky and people start adding you know little heads to things and animals to things and flourishes things you just have this feeling that that people are being slightly let loose so um early 14th century for me i rather like uh, perpendicular um because it allowed people to to bring in other disciplines so stained glass for instance becomes uh, much more highly developed in the perpendicular period because you have larger areas of glass and you have those vertical sides that allow you to put in standing figures and angels and things like that. And it creates lighter buildings. So actually it helps you appreciate the whole of the building by having um, much larger windows. Okay, well, I guess um, maybe this is a controversial thing to say after some of the discussions that we've been having, but I, I feel people don't really stick up for the Victorians when it comes to church buildings. And I, I quite like some of the alterations they do, they've they've done to buildings, particularly um, I'm a fan of a guy called Charles E. McKemp, who did a lot of work in Sussex. And he was kind of an artist and a craftsman. And um, I mean, a couple of the churches I look after have stained glass windows by him. And in particular, um, the church in Cookfield has a barrel vaulted um, ceiling that he's painted, which is just, it's the most wonderful bit of the building. Um, and I think sometimes, maybe it's because I'm an architect, but I like someone who's been brave and made a bold statement with a building. I slightly feel you wouldn't get permission for it now if you, <laughs> if you hadn't done it, but uh, yeah, no, I like Victorian architecture. Oh, yeah, I, th I think you're right there, Jonathan, perhaps <laughs> would struggle to get permission, but um... Yeah, they do get a bad a bad reputation, Victorians, don't they? Mm -hmm. um, we have one final question. I might field it towards Louise um, around towers. It just it came flying in at the last minute. Uh, are bell towers less altered than uh, other building phases? Um, the bottoms of bell towers tend to be less altered. People mess about a lot with the tops. Um, usually raising them um, or, as we saw, putting, you know, parapets and crenellations on them. Uh, generally speaking, and this is very broad brush, people do mess around less with towers, partly because they tend to be very massive, but also because they have bells in, usually. Um, and once you've got bells hung on a frame, um, serious messing around the tower becomes a much more complicated um, experience and certainly by the 18th and 19th century when bell ringing is very popular um, you have what would now be called a sort of social communication problem if you start messing around with with towers you get a lot of angry bell ringers um, and that's not to be messed with so um, for practical purposes uh, the actual sort of mass of a tower tends to be less mucked about with but as I say people do fiddle about with the tops and they they add crenellations or they raise things or they add or remove move spires um, sometimes and I'm sure Jonathan's encountered this sometimes with seemingly little understanding of the engineering stresses involved um, in what they're doing which, which can be a bit catastrophic but um, very broadly speaking the lower down a tower you get the more confident you can be that it's the date at which it was originally built. Yeah that sounds like a, a good summary um, yeah one one example that uh, I came sprung into my mind is uh, one of our churches conservation trust churches in Redbourne in Lincolnshire and you've more or less got half a tower on top of the original tower so and it just and it's a very obvious stage of um, development where yeah it just gets added upon but you get a lot of those earlier windows in towers which is which is really good um, and I well I think that's all we have time for today um, and so all that remains to be said is a huge thank you to our speakers for joining us, uh, giving us a wonderful journey through churches and their different ages and periods of building. There's always something new to learn and discover um, about the country's oldest buildings. And I think I've definitely learned a thing or two today as well. So thank you so much. After the webinar finishes, there should be a link 
our, our browser page pop up, which will take you to um, a short survey feedback page for us. We'd really appreciate if, if you could give us a little bit of feedback. It's only a couple of short questions and it helps us improve on sessions like this. And also if you've got any ideas of what we can do in the future, we'd love to hear them. Um, thank you all for joining us. Thank you for excellent questions and being a wonderful audience. Thank you to Louise, John and Jonathan again. Um, and thank you to our funders, the Heritage Lottery Fund as well. Do join us again at the next live session. But in the meantime, enjoy the rest of your day and um, goodbye. <laughs>